morning everyone welcome to lovely ormond beach um, we are trying out a new video series uh, called take the scenic route where we're going to kind of little known things that are in florida that are not related to the theme parks um, just to kind of give people an idea that florida is more than the theme parks and that there's just a lot to do and see here for any age really so um, just a new video series kind of trying to be doing something positive right now in a kind of negative world. Um, so um, bear with us as we try and figure out how to operate the camera and do videos and all that, because um, it's hopefully it'll be something really special. So, um, but today we are at uh, Ormond Beach at the Casements, which is, um, I think it was the winter home of uh, Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller. And um, now it's, um, I guess the, the house went into damage or something and now it's been refurbished to now it's a, some place that people can walk around and they have exhibits here and everything. So um, we're just gonna see, you know, a little bit of the grounds. It's kind of a rainy day today. So we'll see how much we can film and show you a bit about Ormond Beach. So we look forward to showing All it right. to you. So we are checking out the grounds while we're tour starts at 9 30 and I think um, on Saturdays it's from 8 to, to noon um, the, the hours of operation on Saturdays so we're gonna look around since it's kind of rainy it's gonna be rainy later we might not have this opportunity later so um, just looking around looks pretty pretty beautiful looks like they're setting up something over here Area. This guy over here is feeding some ducks. And just going to a little pavilion over to the lagoon side. learning the operating of this camera on these stairs and even though it's a little bit of a gloomy day it's still pretty out the bridge nice little reflective garden for you definitely a lot of boat ramps Here is the casements, the winter home of John D. Rockefeller. So let's just stroll along, see. We're going to take the tour at 9:30, so it should be interesting to see all that it is. Like I said earlier, it was refurbished, so. It should be pretty interesting. I read on the website they called him, when he was here, they called him Neighbor John because he just kind of did whatever he wanted to do and was just part of the community. Ooh. Make sure I don't fall down, that wouldn't be good. This is probably the area where guests came for parties he had. There's a couple pictures on the website of a Christmas party. And if you couldn't tell as well, it's big truck weekend here in uh, Volusia County, so maybe we'll catch some footage of the big trucks all around here when we're driving around. There's casements. You can kind of see a bit of this sign. And over here is a nice little gazebo like pergola thing not sure when it was put in if it was after it became a historical spot or but interesting to see pictures of this house and there wasn't all of these buildings and road and all this around it so hopefully we'll get a snapshot of that and walk in There's the gift shop and some seating areas. It even kind of smells old in here. 
but it was refurbished after it was found in disrepair. Big open area here. Imagine that they probably had dances and parties and look up. It's an exhibit here called Art is Why I Wake Up in the Morning. Hmm, opened yesterday. I'm guessing they've got like regular events that happen around here. There's a Boy Scout exhibit and this art exhibit. They've got a cooking class, I think. Um, sometimes they show movies, I believe, on the um, grounds, which is maybe what everybody in that, uh, the tent we're putting together was maybe that was for the movie night. So it doesn't look promising because it is going to rain pretty much the rest of the day. So. Lots of interesting pieces. Hmm, looks like this could be a dance classroom or something. Hmm. Interesting. It looks like it was kind of refurbished to be a community building. Here's some pictures of what it looked like. This is the first floor living room. This is also first floor living room. Which they do like everything here. That's pretty much what this is right here. It's all of this. We'll probably go up this way on the tour. And here's a picture of this is the dining room. Which might have been this. is maybe this lobby area. And this is John D. Rockefeller. On the landing. Mom actually just told me she read that he actually died here in this house. So it's a little creepy, but uh, we'll get through it. <laughs> There's actually a picture, if you can see without my reflection, of what it was before they took it over. I think he said in the 70s they took over the house and repaired it and refurbished it to what it is today. But you can see it wasn't in a good condition. Thank you. Much different than it was once now. Uh, um, hotels or properties along the East Coast could, because he wanted people to stop off and be able to enjoy what Florida has to offer. So after he had built up the St. Augustine area, he came to Ormond Beach and saw that hotel that sat across the street, the Hotel Ormond, right there. Uh, it was 73 rooms. Uh, at the time, it was struggling. Um, they couldn't keep the 73 rooms filled. Uh, people who were coming here to Ormond Beach um, were far and few between. If, not a lot of people vacationing in the early 1900s, and if you were, you were pretty much staying with family members. Mm -hmm. So um, he bought the hotel. It was built in 1888. He bought it in 1890. 
for one hundred and twelve thousand five hundred. <laughs> and he thought if he made it larger, more people would come. So he expanded the hotel another four hundred rooms. Wow! When they couldn't keep seventy-three rooms going, <laughs> that was a big gamble. <clears throat> yeah, um, he brought the railroad came down US one, and he brought it across the river. Now there was a small bridge that went across the river for both pedestrians and cars. And in parallel to that, he brought the railroad across to be able to drop people off right in front of the hotel. Um, once he did that, people started coming. <clears throat> President Harding stayed over there. Al Capone stayed over there. Oh. Charlie Chaplin stayed over there. A little side note, in 1926, Ed Sullivan worked over there. He wow. was the golf secretary or uh -huh. golf concierge. Um, but anyway, people started coming. Racing started on the beach in 1902, right here at the end of the causeway. Ormond Beach is known as the birthplace of speed because that's right where it started. Daytona is the birthplace of NASCAR that didn't come around to the 1960s when they were really putting sanctions and, and regulating um, racing. But so uh, Henry Flagler didn't like the race cars being parked around the hotel. He thought it looked a little junky. So he built a 100 car garage right down the street where the Sunbank sits now. Um, and that way the cars could be housed in that garage. If you're interested in seeing the cars or meeting the drivers, you could just march yourself right down there and take part of it. But um, and even though all, all the people, the, the race car drivers and, and staff would stay at the hotel, he didn't have that all around the hotel. <clears throat> so he encouraged his friend, John D. Rockefeller, to start wintering here in Ormond Beach. Now John D. Rockefeller already had uh, houses in Ohio, New York, and New Jersey, and he would winter in Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So Henry Flagler encourages him to come here and stay at his hotel. Well, um, by the time Mr. Rockefeller gets here, which is late 1915, um, Henry Flagler had already passed away. He died in 1913 from injuries sustained falling down the steps in his home in West Palm Beach. Oh, wow. Um, his home, we went there um, as a group this past February, and his stairs were very large and marble. Oh, very high stairs so if you you know fell down those steps you right. didn't really have a chance no <laughs> so anyway um early 1915 john d rockefeller's wife passes away <clears throat> she probably wouldn't have come here anyway she was sickly uh had rheumatoid arthritis very bad she was wheelchair bound <clears throat> on and off with pneumonia so um she passes away in march of 1915 so he comes uh, by October 1915, and he's staying at the hotel <coughs> with a staff of 23 people. Now he has his own chauffeurs, his own housekeeping staff, his uh, attorney is with him, he's got his, uh, <laughs> I, uh, his cousin Fanny Evans who ran the household staff, she's there, um, and they're all staying over there, his own housekeeping staff, his own cooks, and they're pretty happy over there for a couple of years. By 1918, he finds out another guest, also renting a whole floor, is paying less money than him. And when mm -hmm. he inquires about it, they're pretty upfront. We're charging you more because you can afford to pay more. Oh. And he doesn't like that. Uh, so he decides to get out of the hotel. Well, his attorney, William Shepard, tells him the house across the street here is for sale because the Huntington's left by 1916, so this is two years later. Uh, Mr. Rockefeller has Mr. Shepard come over and check the house out to see if it would be appropriate for them. He determines it would be. He has Mr. Shepard act as his agent and buy the house for him. Says he doesn't want the owners to know who's interested mm -hmm. and the price go up. Right. So uh, William Shepard buys the house in 1918 for $75,000 furnished. Wow. He went on to buy six additional lots for another 14000 and that incorporates another large home down on Riverside Drive here um, that uh, is still there today. It's a private residence, but they called it the White House at the time, and that is used for staff. <clears throat> Mr. Rockefeller does some renovations. This porch we're now is a, you know, something you can't get down there. Now, looking at this photograph here, um, that is not dated. We believe it's uh, 1960 because the post office is here. But this is the original 73-room hotel that Henry Flagler bought for 112500 
Mm. And this is the 400 rooms he had. He had his own power plant. So they had electric, hot water, and lights. This is the house at its largest point. This is the dormitories. This was Mr. Rockefeller's personal quarters. It looks a little different than that first picture we saw downstairs because when she added the dormitories, she renovated the front to look more like the rest of the house because it was a classroom. Mm. What year is this photo? 1960, as far as we can tell. This is the Oceanside Golf Club. Mr. Rockefeller played eight holes of golf every day. That's where he got his exercise. His chauffeur could pull out here, drive him up and drop him off to tee off. And there was a spot on the eighth hole where he could sit for him and then bring him back home. <laughs> there were no golf carts. He had a caddy, he had a walk. So he was in his 70s, 80s, 90s, and that was enough for him. Right. That's probably why it was only eight holes. Right. right. Like, that's now, enough for me. The way the house sits now, um, we're at 9,000 square feet. At its largest, um, it was 21,467 square feet. Wow. <coughs> Pretty much, the house is the way it was, the size it was um, when he bought it from the Huntington's, except for the attic. <coughs> this was a bedroom in the bathroom. The bathroom used to sit back there in the corner where the closet is. Uh, this was this room right here. Mr. Rockefeller's bedroom was this one here, well, with the mosquito net. That oh, yeah, his, mosquito that net. That was oh. his actual bedroom. The furnishings in here is not original. This is all here. We use this room for, that table actually opens up pretty long. Uh, we use this for meetings. They also have a um, free uh, counseling group uh, once a month, so they use this room. Uh, the house, like I said, is a cultural center. Sometimes it's rented and sometimes they let people use it. Like for a personal thing, for a wedding, a uh, birthday party, a celebration of life, it's rented. But different groups like the um, garden club uses the house. They don't pay, you know, things like that. And the green they don't have to pay. That's nice. Things for the community. Yes. The items in that glass top table is um, Oh. oh, I didn't see that. What did she say they were? That's original. Oh, Items wow. Here. Glasses. Letters. Maps. <laughs> A compass? No, I think it's an uh, inkwell. Oh. Hmm. Okay, stepping into this room, this is the one room that did not have a bathroom. Uh, when Mr. Rockefeller lived here, uh, this was a flower room. Cousin Davy Evans used to put the flower, uh, fresh flower arrangements together every day. It's believed that when the Huntington's lived here, this was a nursery. Uh, they had two children, one child was actually born here in the house. But this um, here is the picture of Ma Von Lloyd, the lady who ran the girls from the Fairmount uh, Casement Street in College um, from 1941 to 1951. That's her picture. Here she is with her student, Miss Perry. And on the coffee table there, we have a yearbook from 1943. We have a graduation announcement and a diploma in the glass case. Now, just I actually get ready for us because that's all we got a large here over there. But this here on the wall is our montage to racing on the beach that started in 1902. These were the earliest vehicles that raced on the beach. By 1928, the cars looked more like this one. That is the triplex that has a record land speed average. 207 miles an hour on the beach. Well, that was 1928. By 1935, it was this car here. That is the Bluebird. The actual car is on display over the speedway. 
the driver is Sir Malcolm Campbell, and he holds the all-time high record average 276.82 miles an hour on the beach. Wow. <coughs> and there you can see them racing like half in the water. Let's get a picture there. By 1952, this is what it looked like here at Racing on the Beach. That's about us. This here is the north turn. Uh, that there, if you see the back bar, but that is actually um, bleachers and bleachers over here. This particular race had 97 automobiles in the race. Uh, they would race down US, I mean, um, the beach, turn at the north turn, and this is A1A. Notice there's not a house or a hotel or a convenience like store uh, along A1A. Yep, that's the Ponsilla Lighthouse. Racing started on the beach right out here at the end of the causeway. But as things started to progress and people wanted to buy along the A1A area um, for a hotel or a house or a business, they would move the raceway down farther south. So by 1952, they're all the way down to Ponce or to uh, they turned to be shores. Um, by 1958, that's when they built the speedway on International Speedway. They had to get it off the beach because people would want to buy this. Photographs of that Ormond garage that had been black built, the 100 car garage that used to sit down here by the um, where the Sunbank is now. But that burned down in 1976, and that's people you know coming to see the race cars. This is also uh, photographs from the fire, so that burned completely down. So fires were taken out buildings. Everything was wood structures. There is a little replica of that building right, that looks just like that at the end of the causeway here. Inside is a little wood, handmade wooden uh, race car, and that just kind of signifies that we are the um, birthplace of speed. And just over the bridge on the mainland side, there's another building that looks like that. It used to be a place where you could pull in and get an oil change, but somebody recently bought it and they're turning it into a microbrewery. But I think it's called the Ormond Garage Microbrewery, but mm -hmm. it's not open just yet. But in the 1900s, two female, two female architects. Wow. Which are pretty much unheard of yes. at that time. Hmm. That is interesting. Very. Mr. Ingobrecht worked for a magazine, and the magazine uh, needed pictures. So he came and asked John D. if he could take his picture. And no one had ever asked permission for so he after that he made him his personal photographer uh -huh. he wrote a book called neighbor john during the time he lived here in ormond beach which we sell in the gift shop and it has these pictures and more but it talks about you know his personal time with him now this picture here is actually taken downstairs from 1920 to 1932 cousin fanny evans put on a uh, christmas party which we still do that today. Uh, every year we have a Chris big Christmas gala. But Mr. Rockefeller would personally invite people in town to come to this party and he'd have a personal gift for each person when they got here. Yeah. This is my favorite picture of him with his caddy, Walter Wolf, giving him a Rockefeller dime. And there's Walter as an adult, still caddying. But take a look at that coat. Now he's worth over a billion dollars. <laughs> You know, and that coat looks like he found it underneath a bridge. <laughs> and it belongs to somebody m much heavier than him. <laughs> yes. And there's that, that wig. It looks like the one that he needs a haircut. Needs a haircut, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> he's got a water stain up past his knees. But that's how he was. It's a coat. Yeah. I need a coat. Put right. it on and wear it. Wow. And then here's two of his friends that stayed here in the house, um, which was uh, Henry Ford and uh, Thomas Edison. Henry Ford actually gifted him the first V8 automobile off of the assembly line. And there he is with another house guest that would stay here, which was Will Rogers. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture here in Warren Beach of him giving a speech. And there he is at a desk right in his blog. Mm -hmm. 
of the damage. What's so neat is all that they've done to restore this place. <laughs> Parts of the ceiling are missing out of that picture. So that was our tour of the casements. Uh, really fascinating, um, especially to hear how giving um, John, John or JD Rockefeller was, um, he basically gave so much, um, because he believed in honesty and, and giving back to people and building a community. So, um, just a real positive, uh, role model to consider in this day and age. So, um, definitely recommend coming to the casement tour. Um, they had those two exhibits also, um, that are, uh, permanent ones and then they also have art galleries um, they have Christmas things that happen here too so and you know it's free you just donate which is encouraged um, but yeah it's a pretty amazing house is is uh, interesting um, definitely interesting all about the preservation of everything and um, yeah definitely come out it's in Ormond Beach just off of Granada so uh, definitely consider consider going so and with that said uh, We'll be on to our next adventure, so hope you join us as well. See ya!